valuable to us as we go forward. Uh, the other thing that's a little different, and I hope that you all realized when you walked into this room, it was with full awareness that you signed away. You're the fourth, all of us are the fourth speaker on this agenda. The success of this session will depend on you, <coughs> excuse me, uh, participating and thinking. Um, so why this session? So this wasn't just an idea to just have a session here. This is something that's been discussed, I think, for a couple of North American uh, conferences prior. And I think it's based on, we've long gone with the idea of the right tree for the right job in the right place. And that's really a solid concept and one we've been working with. But I think it's a little too simplistic. Uh, what we've seen in the recent years is just this very rapid, this very widespread expansion of agriculture, particularly in commodity crops like corn. And I apologize to your Iowegians here. I realize that's your state, that's your state tree. Um, <laughs> And there's things that are happening in policy in particular that go unrecognized. And in agroforestry, we, we need to be aware of those things because that's what's going to determine our success in advancing agroforestry and advancing in particular agroforestry use. So in these times, I think the questions are a little bit different. Where is that right place for agroforestry? And more importantly, where or under what conditions? Does agroforestry become the right answer that farmers, ranchers, and communities are willing to use? And what do we need to be doing? Today's session is going to consist of three short uh, panel presentations to provide that context. Due to that, and given that the fourth speakers are going to be very impatient, I know they're very excited about giving their talk, write down those ideas. You're going to hear one panelist, the first panelist, there's going to be thoughts there. Listen to that second one and develop it further. By the third one, it's going to be that snowball that you threw down the hill and there was no living snow fence and it's going to accumulate a tremendous amount of mass and importance. Um, so I'm going to begin by actually introducing all three of the panelists. And our first one is Mr. Craig Cox. Uh, Craig is the Vice President um, of Agriculture and Natural Resources with the Environmental Working Group. He leads the uh, based out of Washington, D.C. He leads the organization's research and advocacy work in agriculture, renewable energy, and climate change. He also directs the Environmental Working Group's Midwest office here in Ames, Iowa. He has worked for the National Academy of Sciences, the Senate Committee of Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry, NRCS, and was the executive director of the Soil and Water Conservation Society. Our next panelist is Dr. Rick Cruz over here in the blue. Uh, Rick is professor of agronomy here at Iowa State University. He is leader of the Agriculture System Initiative, and that's looking at integrating modern crop production <coughs> technologies, landscape variability to maximize feedstock production and resource conservation. He is also the director of the Iowa Water Center, and I think many of you have picked up on some of the interesting things that are happening here in Iowa on that topic right now. Of course, anything with a lawsuit is always interesting, right, Rick? <laughs> uh, but it, as in that capacity as director, he works with the universities and agencies in Iowa to address water quality and quantity issues, particularly as they relate to sustaining liquid fuel productions from crop uh, materials. Our third panelist is Dr. Mike Dosky over there. I have had the pleasure of having him on the staff leading uh, the riparian uh, effort. Um, Mike is the research ecologist and his work is really focused on, one, developing the science and tools to understand how buffers work, how to build them, and where to locate them, particularly in terms of water quality again. With the format, again, I urge you, let's try to keep the questions to the end, but again, it is so important for you as the fourth speaker to keep writing down just all your thoughts because it, we're trying to determine with our limited resources, with our limited time, what are those one or two action items that we can develop as a group, as an agroforestry group, to advance ourselves? So let's begin with our first panelist, Craig. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a pleasure to be here today, especially if my presentation shows up. It's a PDF. Is that? Yeah, it's a PDF. Right? Yeah. How do you start a PDF? Just double click on it. Open on. Do you have? Yeah. Cool. How do you pull this? 
Good to go. Does that work? Or? Yep. So um, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about agroforestry. A couple of uh, a couple of caveats to start out. One is I'm going to be talking about agroforestry in the landscape that you saw on that first slide. This is a landscape dominated by annually planted row crops. Uh, I'm going to argue that the future and the potential of agroforestry in that landscape is huge, um, with a couple of additional caveats. One, I think the potential of agroforestry in this particular landscape is only going to be realized if agroforestry sees itself as part of this much larger movement afoot in this landscape to diversify um, this very strange and ecologically weird landscape in which there's green and growing things on the landscape for three or four months and there's nothing growing on the landscape for eight or nine months. So things like cover crops, grassed waterways, prairie strips, saturated buffers, I think if, if we can start, or if you can start thinking about that as part of your community, part of what agroforestry is in this landscape, there's great potential um, for, for this whole concept to grow and to solve some of the most critical problems we face in this landscape, which can only be solved by diversifying that landscape. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to blow through this really fast so my moderator doesn't, he said he'd throw something at me if I go over 20 minutes, so I'm going to try to avoid that. So I'll probably be flying pretty high, but you know, there's hopefully plenty of time for discussion. So let's first talk about the challenges to agroforestry that are arising from the structure of agriculture, the changing structure of agriculture in this landscape. So I think almost everyone knows that one of the major developments in this arena is increasing farm size. You can see this. Farm size increases are very dramatic. As farm size increases, field size is also increasing, which has you know, real implications for where agroforestry or prairie strips can be placed in this production system. Interestingly enough, you know, the Midwest here is ground zero for farm size increase. Farm size has actually doubled in this region compared to smaller farm size increases across the country. And the, um, the other thing that most people don't think about, which is, which is really important when we start talking about policy, is that median farm household income has been higher than U.S. average household income every year since 1996, right? Federal agricultural policy was created in a time when farm, household in, farm households were worse off than U.S. average households. That's no longer the case, which is really sort of making folks rethink what on earth are we doing with farm policy. And also the other really major structural change is this is U.S. farm household income here. And this is farm, or this is U.S. average household income. This is, the bars are farm household income. So two things to notice here. One, for big chunks of the farming community now, off-farm income is really what determines household income. So, so thinking about agroforestry's impact on farm income in this community may not have much significance because it's really, they're not really looking to the farm to drive their household income. The other thing to look at is in those households that are in the commercial farming sector, as we call it out here, they're doing incredibly well. You know, we're looking at a small number, relatively small number of operations, but their household income is far, far above U.S. household income. They're very financially secure, very savvy business people. And, and so I think if we think about agroforestry and where it fits, we really have to think about this 
very diverse and difference between farm operations in this landscape. And this is just a different way to look at it, but the reason I put this slide up is even though these operations are responsible for most of the production of grains and animals in this landscape, these other operations still operate a lot of land. So again, how agroforestry fits into these operations might be significantly different than how it fits into these operations. And the motivations and the perceptions of agroforestry in this operation may look very different than the perception of agroforestry opportunities in these others. So the point is um, the structure, the economic and social structure of agriculture in the Midwest has gone through fundamental changes in the last few years, which will have a big impact on what you're doing in this region. And also, there's also been a really significant change in land tenure, whereas most of the land in the heart of the Corn Belt is now owned by somebody who's not farming it and who instead is leasing it to farm operators. And I think you can um, recognize or appreciate immediately how this complicates the situation. As you have different decision makers that need to be appealed to in terms of any kind of effort to diversify those farming operations. And in some cases, you know, a friend of mine that farms uh, northwest of here uh, has 17 separate landlords that he works with every year to put together his farming operation. Another farmer who's not a friend of mine has 31 separate landlords that he has to work with every year in order to put that farming operation together. So I can't overestimate the implications of this fundamental change in land tenure and the relationship between landowners and operators and landowners and you um, if you start thinking about agroforestry in the Midwest. The other thing we know is that this landscape has expanded substantially in response to the major price boom that we experienced in um, in the last few years. So this is based on USDA's cropland data layer. So that this, this odd landscape that we talked about has moved west and south into, in, into what is in many cases very fragile environmentally sensitive landscapes, which I will come back to in a minute. And that's what, you know, this cropland expansion looks like, right? This is, Taylor County, Iowa in 2010, that's the same area in 2012. You know, if you center on this little pond, you see what happened. So if you're trying, thinking about trying to diversify the landscape and to incorporate agroforestry, this is not the direction we want to see things going, but this is, <laughs> so I got one thing right. Um, but that is the direction things are going. And it's not, you know, here's a nice forested riparian berry. That's what it looked like in 2012. So things have moved in the wrong direction at a rapid pace and are continuing to move in that direction largely because of the way we do agriculture policy. So the opportunities for agroforestry in this larger conception that I put forward is because agroforestry has really unique, simple, effective, and compelling solutions to some of the major challenges that this farming sector is beginning to encounter. Uh, one of which are these incredibly damaging spring storms that are happening increasingly frequently and they're happening during a period of the year when this landscape is most vulnerable because there's nothing growing there. It's after planting and the epidemic of gully erosion and other damage to this landscape is increasingly severe. Increasing the resilience of this landscape to those kind of storm events is one place where agroforestry could play a really tremendously beneficial role. That's, that's more and more being recognized by farmers in this region. The other amazing thing that's happening in this landscape is the explosion of super weeds. These are weeds that are resistant to glyphosate, 2,4-D, dicamba, 
and other products that farmers here have depended on to control weed populations for, you know, ever since we had genetically engineered crops that are resistant, especially to glyphosate. We have a new generation of those crops on the way that are resistant to 2,4-D and dicamba. But how farmers are going to manage this is, is going to be, I think, a tremendous challenge that, frankly, is probably going to challenge the way farming systems operate in this landscape more than any other single thing that, that farmers are going to face. The second opportunity for agroforestry is the environmental problems associated with this kind of agriculture in this landscape are reaching threshold levels that are, are becoming really hard to ignore. And they're becoming increasingly hard to ignore because they're f affecting people in very profound ways at, at very local levels. I mean, you remember, maybe you don't remember, but Toledo lost its drinking water for five days in the summertime last summer because of a toxic algal bloom in Lake Erie that looked like that, although it actually was way bigger than that when it occurred. These toxic algal blooms are now epidemic in the Midwest, and these kind of occurrences affecting public health and drinking water and recreational use are happening over and over and over every summer across this landscape. These are the kind of issues that drive public pressure for change, right? These are the kind of events that drive public pressure far more than Gulf hypoxia, right? Because Gulf hypoxia is too far away, but this is in people's backyards. So that pressure is building as, you know, locally that evidence of that pressure is, is really illustrated by the lawsuit that the Des Moines Water Works has filed against three drainage districts in the upper part of their source water watershed to try to force them to take action to reduce the nitrate levels in the Raccoon River, which they have to struggle to reduce to meet drinking water standards. Um, this is an amazing development, and it's not the only development across the country where folks are increasingly looking for legal statutory um, uh, pathways to get on top of the agricultural pollution that's hitting those thresholds. Again, <clears throat> diversifying the landscape, we've learned over and over from scientists, like some of which are in this room, is really the only ultimate way we're going to reduce those sort of offsite water impacts. We can't do it by simply managing nutrients better on site. You know, if we can't change this picture, we are not going to solve these problems. And clearly, agroforestry, diversification of landscapes, fitting perennials into this landscape is an incredibly important way to change the way that looks. So again, huge opportunity for agroforestry broadly written. Um, you know, if the landscape around Ames looked like this, instead of the landscape it looks like than the pictures I just showed you, I'd be having a very different conversation with you than I am today. So, so this is where we need to go, clearly, and agroforestry can help get us there. But our public policy stands utterly in the way of the direction we want to go. And I won't dig into this too deeply because <clears throat> not too many people should have the experience of having to become an expert in crop insurance. It's not, <clears throat> it's really not good for you. <clears throat> but I want you to, st I just want you to stare at this slide for a minute because one, crop insurance has now become the fundamental way that you support farm income. And it's incredibly expensive at a minimum $9 billion a year that you put into the crop insurance program, mostly to, to pay for two-thirds of the price of a crop insurance premium that a farmer buys. So the first thing I want you to look at is this, it's hard to wrap your head around this, but there's actually a return on investment in crop insurance for farmers, which means farmers make money by buying crop insurance. 
the crop insurance program is so generally subsidized, so generously subsidized that farmers can expect over time to make more in claims than they pay in premiums, right? That's a fundamental violation of any conception of, of an insurance program. So crop insurance is not insurance. It's a form of income support. It, it operates more like a lottery than it operates like an insurance program. So, so that's one thing. The second thing is, look at this red line. That's the return on investment, the dollars above premiums, for farming the riskiest land, right? So it's, there's far more return from farming riskier lands than there is for farming land that's less risky. So how, just think about how that affects decision making about what land is going to be brought into production and how it's going to be managed. It's incredibly destructive. And this is what we did to you in the 2014 Farm Bill. So here's the relative investment in crop insurance and these other new subsidies that were ginned up. 55 billion according to the Congressional Budget Office. 27 billion in the conservation programs that we are thinking is somehow going to stand up against that. It's not going to happen. It is not going to happen. This is huge policy failure. And if you're thinking about diversifying the landscape, here's the crops that benefit from these subsidy programs. So the big five, only 6% of all those subsidies to go, go to crops other than these big five crops. It's not much better. It's a little better in crop insurance, but not that much better. As one farmer told me, you'd be completely insane in Iowa to do anything except maximize corn and soybean acres. There's absolutely no reason to diversify into other crops when those two crops have this kind of protection. So the conservation programs are simply not standing up against this pressure. We tend to focus on how many new grassed waterways we've put in as our measure of success, and sometimes that's great, right? 2011, we've put in a new waterway, we all feel good about it. But what we don't look at is the reverse. If you can voluntarily put in a grassed waterway or a buffer, you can voluntarily take that grassed waterway or buffer out. And here's one example of that. Here's a buffer, nice buffer in 2011. Here's that same area in 2014. We're looking at this at, in a handful of watersheds in Iowa, and we're, we think the initial results are going to show that between 2011 and 2014, on net, we're slightly worse off than we were in 2011 in terms of what practices are in place. Um, that's the fundamental, inherent, inescapable weakness of voluntary programs. And, and I think the circumstances that we face now are going to challenge us to really think hard about those voluntary programs that we've used or relied on almost entirely to deal with these kind of problems on the landscape and problems with which agroforestry could have a lot to say. But my feeling is after 30 years in this business that it's time that we really have to set standards that this is not allowed, that this has to be fixed. It's not optional for this to happen on the agricultural landscape. So there has to be some basic standards of what's acceptable for farming in the Midwest. Then we can argue about to what extent there should be financial or other assistance to producers to meet these standards. That those are two separate policy discussions that are often confused and mixed together to confuse you know, this discussion. But absent these standards, some kind of standards, we're going to continue to see what I showed you previously, which is conservation practices, diversified plantings blinking on and off across the landscape without any net cumulative positive effect. So that's what I think we're up against. I think there's huge opportunities for agroforestry in this region, if you conceive of it as part of this larger movement. But there, you're swimming against a very strong current that's created by a changing structure of agriculture and really screwed up agriculture policy.
Thank you very much, Craig. And if anybody would like to talk more about crop insurance, um, Craig Cox is, a, is an expert on it, but I, I do appreciate that it's not for nice many job. of us that maybe aren't <laughs> strong enough to stomach it. Mm -hmm. Our next panelist is Dr. Rick Cruz. Let's see. Got a I'll figure it out. I'll find a way. Well, normally I don't wear a coat in a place, but I thought they had the refrigerator turned on when I walked in here, so. But it's good now. This way it just hides my sweat. I don't, people don't see how nervous I am. I'm disappointed a little bit in the introduction because the most important part is the world's second best fisherman. That's me. And the third best YouTube. <laughs> That's another story for another day, another time. Um, after hearing your statement that the right tree at the right place at the right time and listening to what Craig said, I might just as well sit down and ask questions as talk about, anyway, we'll do it anyway. Okay, okay. So, uh, yes. Okay, so before I step through some things, there are three questions I want to ask you relative to where we are headed in the agricultural landscape. Uh, number one, what evidence exists that we are on a functionally sustainable path currently? And you know, we in research, we're looking for evidence to draw conclusions, to draw relationships between different components as an exercise. Take two sheets of paper. On one sheet of paper, write all the evidence that you can think of that we are on a functionally sustainable pathway. On the other sheet of paper, write all the evidence that suggests that we're not. Which one of those sheets of paper is going to have more ink on it when you're done? That's the fear. That's reality. Okay, so if we're not on a sustainable path, do we have a vision of what that path is? If we don't have a target, if we don't have an endpoint, it's very difficult to design a pathway to get there. And the other one is, do we have the political will to address the causes rather than the symptoms of our current problems? It's very happy to see you put up the nutrient reduction issue that exists in Iowa. How are we trying to solve our nutrient issues? What is the one practice that's got a whole lot of coverage? Cover crops. Okay, absence of cover crops is not the problem. The problem is, as Craig mentioned, it's a cropping system. How many people talk about the cropping system as the source? Well, we don't talk about that. We'd rather talk about edge of field practices, cover crops wetlands, all these other things, but in reality it is the system. That's just example, an example of our inability to address the issue. So what would you, what, what does this look like? <laughs> Crosshairs, a target, right? Okay, so if we're going to address conservation, particularly agroforestry, there's some components within that target that we must address. One of those are, is, is our people. Must target people, the right people, and the right space. Okay, so it's space. What do we mean space? We've heard people talk about putting shelter belts in Nebraska and, and the western U.S. for a particular reason. It fits. In Iowa, this, this is a output from a, a release we just have done this year, the Daily Erosion Project, where we estimate erosion for every hut 12 in Iowa every day of the year. And we've simply accumulated those erosion estimates and given you an annual estimate for each HUC-12 for each of the years that are identified, sheet and reel erosion. Uh, they're color-coded ranging from zero to one up to greater than 50 tons per acre for that given year. Okay, now the point I want to make here is that every year is different. Precipitation is different. There's some different management maybe between years. But we also see certain areas that are more vulnerable to soil loss. If you're going to invest energy in trying to get any conservation practice, it's particularly something that's viewed as semi-permanent, and that's agroforestry. That's different than cover crops. Cover crops are handy for farmers because it's in this year, it's out next. Agroforestry is something that is viewed more permanently. You're probably not going to try to put, convince a farmer to grow trees in the, in the drainage area but you may have a better shot in, uh, in those areas where you see bright red. Okay, that's uh, those years. This is 2011 through 2014. You see the same trends, certain areas. 
And if you uh, average them all together, average across the state. Okay, another point here. When you hear average erosion for a given state and they give you a number, here's 5.7 tons per acre per year, average across eight years, they average across the whole state, what does that tell you? Nothing. Tells you nothing. Now there are certain farm groups that are trying to break their arm, patting themselves on the back because they think this number looks pretty good. Well, you can drown in a stream that averages six inches deep. <laughs> The same, but, but the issue here is where do you want to invest your energy? Right tree, right place, right time. Okay, so there's space. There's another dimension of space. Does, can anyone tell me what that is? Say it again. Irrigation pivot. Okay, that's an answer. That's the right answer. That's not the one I was seeking. <laughs> Lost again. It's a yield map. Okay, greens are good, high yields, reds are not so good. There is an industry now, or an effort, and a successful effort, superimposing on top of this the layer of, of production cost and commodity price. So instead of having a yield map, we now have a profit map. Almost every field in the state of Iowa and across the nation have areas where consistently Farmers lose money. There is an opportunity. I had one farmer tell me, this wasn't very long ago, and he's a big operator here near Ames, Dennis Smith. He says, if I could, I would grow trees as, a, as, as my retirement investment. I said, why don't you? He says, I rent all my land. I like like uh, Craig was saying. But there is the opportunity. How big a space does it take to get a farmer interested in doing that? Why try to grow corn and beans or whatever crop in areas where you're losing money? A spatial opportunity. Okay, and then we have this bell-shaped curve. Okay, why would he show that? Well, in dealing with people, you have producers that will die for conservation. They're, they're good, good people out there. You have others that could absolutely, seemingly care for less. They've got their planter hanging out over the river as they're putting in that last roll that before the year's over is going to fall into the river, into the bank, or down the bank like Craig was showing. Which one of those groups, if you want to get things in place, are you going to target your energy? You're probably going to start here hopefully move a few of those in the middle ground in that area. Okay, so that is a human dimension, but we're going to take that human dimension really where it belongs with agroforestry, and that is, oops, anyway, the landowners. The point that was made again, Craig, the majority of our land is rented. Is a renter going to plant a tree? No, not unless the landowner says thou shalt. And that's a possibility. We've got some landowners out there that are very dedicated to conserving their investment. Now we have others, 21% 20 of Iowa is owned by people that live outside of the state of Iowa. We have others that are more interested in the rent check than anything else. Do you know what a rental auction is, a land rental auction? We have more of those happening attractive land, the lease is up, so we have bids. Whoever gives the highest bid has the opportunity to rent that ground. Now on the, on the surface that's really scary, and it is scary for a lot of situations, but understand a, a, a landowner could put within that lease, you will have grass waterways, you will have this, you will have that. Does that happen? I don't know, that's a study that needs to be done. But again, it's targeting the right person. Okay, so as we try to, to couch or move the agroforestry into ag, what ag realities are we facing? Agriculture is morphing into agribusiness. It is a business industry. We have fewer farmers, control, farmers controlling more. The enterprise size, as Craig mentioned, is increasing. The difference between culture and business is significant. 
Culture is multidimensional with the philosophy that if we do everything right, the money will come. Agribusiness, business is if we make enough money, we can buy what we need. So if we want to design policy to create the right behavioral change, we have to understand those are different. And as we morph into business, we have to also understand that businesses are regulated, cultures are not. How might agroforestry fit into a regulated agribusiness environment? If agriculture was told you will have this to conserve water and soil resources, where might agroforestry fit in? You need to be active in those areas. As I would argue that regulation is, there's increasing pressure to create standards for which we operate in the non-point world. Farming is incredibly competitive. Farmer A helping Farmer B, well, that used to be common. Now, it's more challenging. Why are rent prices, why are land prices so high? Farmers bid against each other, trying to eke out that last, last bit of profit. If you don't make money, you don't farm. How does that play? For, trees have to have a value. We go back to these areas that are non -prof, not profitable in a field. Okay, there, there's an opportunity. But you're probably not going to take crop ground that consistently produces 250 bushels per acre, I don't mean soybeans, but corn, and move those into trees. But there, there, there may be the opportunity. Voluntary conservation approaches work best when the incentives and benefits are aligned. What? What does that mean? The incentive for, for investing in a conservation practice, the incentive for investing in a conservation practice is the increased profit you get several years down the road. That's the benefit. The incentive for using conservation practices is the benefit or the yield increase that you'll get years down the road from conserving those soil and water resources. The incentive is the benefit. Okay, now let's take a land renter. The incentive for you for investing in a conservation practice is it's not there. It's not my land. I'm not going to capture any economic return from investing in a conservation practice if I only have a short-term lease. So the incentive and benefit if you're going to voluntarily use conservation practice based only on money, they have to be aligned. The majority of harvested land, as we said, is rented, so the incentives and benefits are not well aligned. It's reality. Markets are farmed, not the land. How many farmers or decision makers today look at their crop rotation, look at their spatial plan on their farm based on soil and water resources versus how many go to the USDA report to see how many acres of corn and bean or beans are going to be planted and what the market price is likely to be? Sorry. It sucks, but it's reality. Okay, ag reality, strong, uh, very strong ag and industry lobby. Who is the biggest investor in the current farm program? Wells Fargo, because of the crop insurance. Industry doesn't often well align with soil and water conservation issues. Can we compete with that? We don't have the money. We don't have the money but you have to be active in that arena. Agroforestry is not well supported in policy. Sorry. Because of the competition, those farmers that are interested in exploiting get rid of grass waterways to get the last bushel of corn, planting right at the edge, not only compete, they pull this individual. Remember, you have to make money if you're going to farm. 
they move this group in the wrong direction. They move that group in the wrong direction, unfortunately. It's pressure. What's new increasing watershed focus? There's a talk next door talking about that. Can peer pressure create enough incentive to change what we see on the landscape? Industry is recognizing sustainability issue. At least they're using the word. And I don't know if they're typically or intentionally trying to bastardize the term, sorry, sustainability, change the definition. It's easier to do that than change the industry. But they're, but they're making, that, they're making that, that motion. The food industry, even Walmart, is talking about sustainability. Well, they, are they serious? Who knows? I've had various talks where I had farmers say, we have to have standards. We need regulation because that SOG, son of a gun, next door is doing things that I'm not doing and I can't compete with him economically. What's not new? Specialization, increasing specialization, loss of cultural based management skills. We want to be able to plant. We want, we want to be able to have the directions for farming that you can write on a postage stamp. We've lost skill in the farmer arena, farm population, to do the type of cultural management necessary to make this thing go. Uh, we continuously increase size, scope, Government policies in conflict with conservation. Craig gave an excellent example or examples of that. Degradation of soil and water resources continue. So what's the elements of a fix? Last slide. We have to have a goal. We have to have a plan. And that goal and the plan, we have to have a commitment to it. We have to realize that agriculture and business are different. And the vision has to be longer than a single farm bill. You're not going to grow trees that take many years and base it on a five-year planning horizon. Policies that don't put conservation committed farmers at a competitive disadvantage. And we do all these types of things really well right now, putting them at that disadvantage. And we have to be able to address the problem and not only the symptom. Symptoms are easy. Amen. <laughs> Next panel is Dr. Mike Stasky, and it, you're getting sadder and sadder oh, and sadder. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey. Well, uh, what, what, well what thanks. We're doing is being educated as to what the realities are. You can give us the answer. The question is taking uh, the larger realities. The um, let's make yeah, that happen. That's, that's good for And Craig's going to give us the answer. <laughs> with his 30 years of experience, if anybody can survive uh, dealing with crop insurance, he can help guide us. <laughs> okay. All right. So, Mike? Well, my role here as a panelist is not, you know, uh, it's pretty tough to follow Craig and Rick and the powerful message that they have. My role here is to try to answer this question, try to get you to help answer this question. We're within the context of agriculture and conservation issues that Craig and Rick have brought up. Where does agroforestry fit? Craig identified a few opportunities. Rick also uh, identified uh, a few opportunities. And we want to try to embellish that list as much as we can. Um, as Craig and Rick both mentioned there are lots of issues uh, surrounding modern agriculture. Uh, we worry about food production, sustainability of it, because we have a, you know, we're eroding our productive capacity. Uh, we also worry about the, the economics of our rural communities and rural farms. Uh, we also have a growing public concern for what I call ecosystem services, the water quality, wildlife issues. All, all issues that Rick and Craig have already brought up. And agroforestry has been pitched throughout this meeting as a solution to some of these, to some, most all of these problems. It can be part of the solution. Here's, here's a, you know, I just, uh, just for the sake of uh, getting you to think about 
agroforestry's role in solving some of these problems. Here are a variety of benefits or issues that agroforestry is being pitched to solve. We hear about windbreaks for crop and livestock protection. We hear about uh, uh, you know, alley cropping, windbreaks, hedgerows for pollinators to enhance crop production. Agroforestry crops is providing a crop diversity, a multi-crop systems, uh, soil erosion control, soil health. We heard from Tom the uh, day before yesterday, uh, water pollution solution. We, you know, a lot of our field trip yesterday was about how agroforestry practices could help solve or reduce these water pollution problems. Water temperature problems if you're in the Northwest and worried about fisheries, that's a huge issue. Agroforestry has a role there. Air quality, her wind breaks and mixing of uh, mixing of the atmosphere to improve, uh, to mitigate uh, odor problems um, or dust, the wind breaks for dust control, wildlife enhancement, wildlife corridors. And then most uh, recently, a most recent benefit that's popped up in our, on our list is greenhouse gas mitigation. We heard some of that yesterday. Nitrous oxides carbon sequestration, those sorts of issues, because climate change is becoming a big issue that we, want to, that we want to try to address, and we think we can with agroforestry practices in certain circumstances. Well, with this list of benefits that we could be getting from agroforestry, this list of issues that agroforestry can help address in modern agricultural systems, you'd think then you know, every producer out there would become running to us. You know, we'd have them lined up out the door, signing them up, and we'd all be busy trying to implement, you know, satisfy all those landowners, but it's not happening. And, you know, Craig and Rick sort of showed some statistics, and this is just, uh, you know, an example that I found. Um, here's an example from riparian forest buffers that are enrolled in FSA programs as of September 2012. Now. Riparian forest buffers at this point in time is, represents far greater than, than half of all agroforestry practices that are enrolled in USDA programs. And it amounts, in 2012, it amounted to uh, less than a million acres. Uh, it kind of seems like a lot until you compare that with all the acres that are out there that could, pen, could potentially be enrolled, which is, you know, 400 times that. So obviously, land, this is just an example. Landowners are not running to us to help them design or implement agroforestry practices. So the question here for this session, the question to all of you here to help us answer is why? Why aren't they running to us? Craig gave us some you know, powerful reasons for that. Um, but there's also we might be able to break it down into some smaller bits where we can see some opportunities. And the questions we need to ask ourselves are, well, are we targeting the right people? Craig showed us that there's a difference between landowners. And those landowners will have different motives. And we might be able to target those landowner groups that have the right motivations that are amenable to adopting agroforestry. Now the question is, well, are we there? We might be talking to people who would be amenable to adopting agroforestry, but are we giving them the information that they need to convince them to make that choice? We need to ask ourselves, are we providing the right information? What we've heard already also, are there barriers? Are there disincentives for uh, adopting agroforestry? Or are there even tailwinds for adopting agroforestry that we're not capitalizing on? We're not. A, even within the agroforestry community, we're not aware of what those tailwinds might be. There might be some small uh, policy tailwinds that might be able to help us, but we're not capitalizing on those things. Another question is, we see what the status is of agriculture now. Craig and Rick have provided us a really solid picture of what that is. But what are the trends in policy? the drivers of public policy or the drivers in public opinion? What are those trends that might be favoring future adoption of agroforestry? Or, or are there trends moving to the future that might be disincentives for adopting agroforestry? And I and I'm hope that our discussion today touches on some of those things. What's the future? 
And then finally, the alternative view. Are we all just okay with the way agroforestry is being adopted now? Are we just satisfied with just uh, following the trends as they come along, taking advantage of opportunities that are basically handed to us? Or do we want to be a little bit more proactive? try to move things and move the dial in certain directions. So these are the questions that I'd, hopefully I'd like us to all engage in a discussion of and search for answers for. And then finally, when we start feeling like we have some answers to those questions, how should the Agroforestry Center then respond to those answers? Do we want to be passive? Do we want to be active? In what way should we, should we do those things? So that's my role here. It's just to get you thinking about those, those questions. To get this discussion started, then, uh, just a couple of comments. Here is, uh, this uh, is a quote that I pulled out of chapter one of the book, North American Agroforestry, that Gene Garrett and others had, had edited and published just a few years ago. This, this came out of the second edition. Jim Lasoy from Cornell, Louise Buck, Dean Current then wrote this first chapter, and one quote popped out that seemed, you know, that just, it resonated with me. Uh, they figure one of the big problems that we have in advancing agroforestry is the absence of a clearly defined population of practitioners. Agroforestry appears pretty diffuse. Observe the posters, the talks. Agroforestry takes, comes in all shapes and sizes. And maybe that's kind of a hindrance to identifying clearly defined population of practitioners. If we don't, if we can't clearly define them, then we don't know if we're pitching agroforestry to the right people, to people who would potentially adopt. We don't know if in research and development we're developing the right information that they need to make that choice. We also don't have uh, we also need uh, for, if we decide we want to move policy, we also need to identify those uh, potential advocates in the policy realm. And so we need, and those advocates are gonna be based upon the demand by the public. So we need to identify who those people and who those practitioner, potential practitioners need to be. So, this is kind of the way that I think about how, how we need to start answering some of those questions. So the question is, well, who might, if we're going to answer that main question, solve that one problem, who is it that might adopt agroforestry? Craig started to identify that there are different groups of people out there that are farming, that are farmers, that are part of the agricultural sector, and they're not all the same. In Iowa, clearly we, clearly we focus on corporate farms or large family farms, um, high sales farms, large farms. Uh, and we tend, and many of us tend to focus on that, but there, but there are other kinds of farmers out there, landowners out there, that have different motives. Cash rent farmers have different motives than uh, absentee landowners, well, maybe the same. They're both interested in profit, but some of them might be a little bit more altruistic. Uh, specialty niche farmers might be another group or people who are interested in that that we might be able to speak to and identify. Limited resource, subsistence, subsistence farmers, they're not so much interested in profit. They're just interested in feeding the family. A little bit of cash flow, stability of income. Then there's hobby farmers, retired farmers. These are people who have income from off the farm. They're not quite as interested in, in income and profit as, say, the corporate farms or cash rent farmers. So they have different motives. Tribes. We are at a meeting here about uh, three weeks ago in St. Louis. You know, there are 562 federally recognized Native American tribes in the U.S. 562. And they are very diverse in their needs. But one thing they have in common is they're all very interested in culturally important species. That might be an opportunity for us. And then uh, we also, uh, at least through our, through our tour here in, in Iowa, you see corn and soybeans everywhere, but let's not forget livestock operators. There's a lot of confined livestock operations out there. 
There's also ranchers. I call them sort of free range, you know, free range chickens, free range pigs, but also, but mainly when you think ranchers, you're thinking, you know, you're thinking, you know, the Wild West and, you know, a rancher riding his horse across the prairie, and, you know, and grazing, you know, thousands of acres. But here's a list of people. We might be able to subdivide that sort of conglomerate group of what we call farmers or people engaged in agriculture. Divide them and be able to identify people who have a motive that is consistent with adopting agroforestry. Finally, the question that, you know, I hopefully that we will also get around to. There are motivating forces. This, these are, this is, this is just my imagination here. I don't have all the answers. I'm not a social scientist and this is not really my realm, but when I think about it, these are the forces that are motivating <coughs> people on the balance motivating our landowners to choose the kind of land use that they adopt whether and we heard the the, the uh, among them you know food demand well we all need to, we all need to eat so we all need food uh, the USDA uh, one of the USDA goals is to make sure that we have a supply of cheap plentiful food and that reflects in policy our production policy um, Profit is a big part, a big motivator of big ag uh, in most agriculture. But we also have conservation programs. We're trying to encourage people to adopt land uses that, uh, or land practices that um, provide some resilience and, uh, and sustainability or production systems. Local product markets, the, uh, some people might want to take advantage of them. That's also a force. Conservation compliance, currently, uh, don't know, there is a little bit of conservation compliance, but it's not huge. Environmental markets, and then of course the R word, regulation, which those two are almost non-existent right now. But in the future, there might be some potential. There may be some forces like public, like public opinion that are moving policy and regulation and these other forces in a different direction. So the question to you then, I'm just going to, now I'm just going to, I'd like to just toss it up for discussion. Did I leave anything off of this? Do you see yourselves in this list? Do you see opportunities in this list of potential adopters? So rather than me talk at you, I'd rather have you start to talk to me, answer some questions. Wow. answer some of these questions. Uh, and before we do that, uh, what I would like to ask is the panelists um, go up there due to the recording um, procedure of this. Um, if you sure. guys could sit up there. Sure. Um, and, and you'll need to pass that mic around so they are recording this session. Uh, so do please repeat the question. And I do ask those of you that uh, uh, are bringing up a comment or asking a question, uh, for your first one, just identify your name and what entity you're working with, and speak loudly. Okay, question. Answers. Did we, did we leave anything? Did we leave anything off of that list, or do you think there's another uh, another perspective for? you know, addressing these questions. Where does agroforestry fit in the U.S.? Eric. So, Eric Hagan from Penn State University. Um, I'm curious as to what the, the potential for public lands for agroforestry, hmm. say DNR, BLM, um, both for- That's a Western DCM question. To, to agroforestry, <laughs> but also for the management of agroforestry, not for forest products and that sort of thing. Do you see that heading? Do you see agencies looking into agroforestry as potential for large-scale public land, land management? I have no idea. It's an interesting question, though. There's the answer. I, it is something I've been thinking about, and um, in fact, I'm going to be having um, some meetings over the next couple weeks with people in National Forest Systems, that part of the Forest Service, because 
because I, I believe there is some opportunity there. Um, but uh, I'll find out and let you guys know. Leila, well, you, know, you mentioned this morning grazing on grazing on forest lands yes, for, for fire example, control. Um, I mean, it serves a couple of different purposes: profit for a landowner, but also the public Mike, lands benefit. Are you, are you oh. Hold the mic, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I remember many years ago going on a tour of um, one of the national forests in Oregon, and there were sheep farmers, uh, Peruvian. Um, We're going to try it. Maybe. Just as an example, many years ago, um, I went to a national forest in Oregon where there was a, a Peruvian, uh, Peruvian sheep farmers had been hired by someone to graze sheep in the national forests. And so um, I'm going to be looking into um, goat. You know, I, I'm not saying that's going to be possible, but I am going to be asking about that. I have a meeting with the... Um, National Forest System person that handles um, non what, what they call specialty forest products to learn more about. But I just asked her really quickly: Is that an uh, an opportunity or a possibility, producing specialty forest products in, on national forest lands? And she said, "Yeah." So I need to learn more. But it's already being done. It's done a lot of, wait, there wait, a lot wait. <laughs> there are a lot of uh, products that are already being harvested on national forest lands. Uh, mushrooms is huge in, right. in the West, but on the West Coast. More about production, not just collection. Not just, not just, oh, yeah. Agroforestry. Okay. More, more, more right. intentional. intentional. Yeah, intentional farming. Well, the grazing certainly sounds like it has a lot of possibilities. I don't, Craig, do you know anything about, do you sort of keep up on uh, uh, grazing policy or farm bill policies related to grazing and livestock? Yes. Would that have any impact here or any relevance? <clears throat> well, so, um, you know, the old saying is one should never waste a good crisis. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of livestock production in the West that's in some of the worst crisis that these folks have seen in their lifetimes. So is there an agroforestry contribution to transitioning out of the current grazing system to something that maybe deals with uh, long-term drought better? I, I don't know the answer to that, but um, there's huge, I mean, this, it's tragic what's happening in a lot of the Western grazing lands. And, and I think of those folks are really coming up against the questioning themselves, does, does this make sense going forward? Can I keep doing what I've been doing on my family ranch for the last 50 years? Is that going to work going forward? I mean, that would be a place. If there are other opportunities to, you know, help them think through that transition, if there is a transition, that's one big opportunity. Do we have anybody here who does livestock? Livestock work? You might be able to sort of respond to that question. Okay. Just to speak. It's on. It's on. Okay. Um, I work. <coughs> I work in the southeast, um, based in Alabama. Um, there is um, woodland grazing um, with the NRCS, and they provide some of the fencing and watering facility there. Uh, but I'm not sure what is the limitation um, in regards of the acreage. Um, but but that fits very well in the around grazing system when there is not much uh, warm season forages um, coming up. Uh, during that time, and the cool season forage is already gone. Um, if there is any program that we can push for fencing that woodland, that provides a lot of opportunity for supplementing the food for the animals, and at the same time, uh, decreasing the fire hazard, the possible fire hazard that create because of a lot of understory um, plants.
Okay. Did I? Not got yet now, Thank you. I think the the speakers have uh, laid out all the challenges and opportunities about agroforestry. A lot of research has been done the last 20, 25 years. We have all the information at hand. I think what is lacking is increasing awareness, how we communicate this information to the public, policymakers, landowners. I think that's very important because we, unless we send this message out and let the landowner, it can be the private landowner or the renter, ad to address these problems will not achieve our goals. So also I want to add, you know, training the young generation about agroforestry in high schools, universities, training farmers. These are uh, very important strategies. You guys want to respond at all, or keep keep, keep the discussion going? So. Okay. Um, this is Jerry Neal. I'm at the Leopold Center, and I'm going to add to that because I think what I was thinking about maybe complements the point that you just raised. And uh, just a few years ago, the, the group of us were thinking about the policy issue and the conversation at that time. This before you came, just before you came on board, was wow, how can we have conservation policy that lets agroforestry practices in when nobody in Washington even knows the word agroforestry. You know, there's, it's not a part of a conversation. And so there is this, um, inter, um, it's, what is it, inter, the agroforestry interagency, interagency agroforestry team, which is supposed to be working on this. And there was an effort to get some uh, numbers into the census of ag so that we could start reporting some numbers because that's what would have cash cache and i guess um in the same question that's being raised here of how where and how to intervene to start raising that conversation so that um agroforestry is a term that's being used at all levels, you know, starting at the higher policy levels, which are, dri are, are a big driver in what's happening on the land now, um, and, and then moving down onto the ground is, is something that I'm thinking about in terms of this, com this conversation. Please, can you just add to that? Yep. I'm going to address this. Michelle Schoenberger. Um, I'd like to address this actually to the panel with your expertise, because I think, Craig, you brought up right away that we need to perhaps be part of that larger community instead of talking about agroforestry, agroforestry being part of some larger foundation or basis. And I, you know, what's in a word? Well, I think that's going to be really important. And uh, maybe you guys have some perspective of what is that word that we can be part of that larger effort? And then who do we need to connect with? Who wants to start? Um, so, yeah, that, I think that's kind of the, so I know very little about agroforestry, just so you know, but um, I, think, I think the challenge to your community is the same challenge to a lot of communities who are trying to advance um, a particular objective, and that's to decide what are you, right? Are you scientists and technicians? Are you a movement? You know, what, who are you? And, and what is this community? And, and, and what's the target, right? So that's a big discussion, right, within your community. Because if you're going to start doing communications, if you're going to start doing policy advocacy, if you're going to go start going down that road, that there, there's a whole infrastructure that needs to be constructed in order to advance those objectives, right? I mean, this is who the Environmental Working Group is, right? I mean, our, our, I mean, we're basically a communications shop. That's what we do research, and we work with media, and we have lobbyists. I mean, that's the kind of structure that if you, if you want to take those goals seriously, you have to build that infrastructure. And that means you have to become a movement. And, 
and you know, if you're going to go down that road, it has to be 100 percent. Right, it can't be 10% of what you do, because that isn't going to get you anywhere. So, so, so there's sort of a fundamental um, identity question, I think, for agroforestry. In terms of communications, the worst thing you could do in communications is talk about agroforestry. Right, you have to talk about water quality. You have to talk about opportunities for beginning farmers. You, you have to talk about the things that people want and then you can explain to them how agroforestry contributes to these larger goals right i mean we've learned this lesson over and over again by like talking about no-till right who the hell wants to talk about no-till <laughs> right so so you have to talk about why you have to you have to connect to the wants and desires that that people have and that are eventually reflected in the political landscape. And that's what you need to talk about. And talking about agroforestry is like at the bottom of that message. And, and that's the mistake that people make over and over and over again when they come and testify in Congress, when they try to talk to, I mean, I promise you trying to talk to a New York Times reporter about agroforestry is almost as bad as trying to reform crop insurance. <laughs> right. so, um, so that would be my advice on the communication side. And then on the movement side, there are some really cool things going on where agroforesters, I think, could make a huge contribution. I'm an obsessed trout fisherman. So I'm very familiar with this m incredible project going on in the Driftless area. I don't know how many folks know what that is. It's a really amazing landscape in northeast Iowa, or <clears throat> southeast Minnesota, southwest Wisconsin. Um, and there's a hugely successful project going on there driven by Trout Unlimited. They're working with landowners. They're trying to restore stream corridors for trout fishing, of course, thank God. And, um, y you know, I think part of the agroforestry strategy is to find the easier opportunities, to plug in to where things are already moving. And, and, to, and that's where you can really start to advance and to show how what you have to offer advances what other people are already really trying to do. And there's passion behind that, that goal, right, of, you know, making the Driftless Area a huge target for trout fishing, right? There's, I promise you there's a lot of passion <laughs> around that goal. And if you can connect what you know and what you can offer to passion, that's where, you know, you start to get traction. So, and I would look, you know, the other place I would look, and then I'll shut up, but there are all kinds of young people that are trying to get into farming. And, and it's Im almost impossible to get on the corn and bean farming if you don't have land, right? So they're trying to grow vegetables. They're doing CSAs. They're doing local food. They're, you know, so what does agroforestry have to offer those folks? I don't know the answer to that. But that's a very felt need. There's a lot of passion around that. Is, is there a place that you can address and support that passion in agroforestry? That's the opportunities, I think, is where there's passion, where there's movement, and where you have something really important to offer. Want to come in? Um, I saw Amy first, because she got <laughs> Uh, I'm Amy Swan from Colorado State University, and um, my question is is kind of going to go back to the science, and there's kind of two parts. One, have you know, is there sufficient scientific evidence, or have we synthesized all of the evidence that exists in order to really convince policymakers and the public that the way that we're currently doing things is problematic? And then the follow-up to that is, you know. Has the science also demonstrated that 
alternative sustainable futures are a better option. And by that I mean, you know, can we argue that these these other visions that we have for agriculture w can supply all of our food needs because I think there's a lot of people that would come back at some of these things and say, no, we have to plow out all those field edges. We've got to have these big planters. We've got to work on a, a large and efficient scale. And so I guess I'm curious what your thoughts are on where the science is on, on both of those questions. Better ask a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if we got one up here. Mike, sorry. Uh, the answer is absolutely yes on both of them. We do have the data. We do have everything it takes to identify that what we're doing right now cannot be last. Can, cannot go on indefinitely. Uh, do we have the science to show that we can use alternative approaches to produce the quantity of and, and kinds of food we need? Absolutely. I mean, we we can meet the food needs independent of production if we reduce waste, grow things more efficiently, reduce spoilage losses between harvest. Uh, there, there are other approaches too. So, so yes, the challenge we're facing is big money and the power that individuals have in the lobbying arena. So I'm not a scientist, but I played one at the National Academy of Sciences for five years. <laughs> um, but I think in this whole, dis this whole discussion of feeding the world is really a critical issue. But th the discussion almost totally f um, focuses on supply and not demand. And demand is shifting profoundly within the food system. So I, th I think unless you really look at the demand side and, and what's happening to the way people are eating, um, you, you get trapped because demand is not stable at all. So, you know, a generation from now, what's going to be needed to meet that demand may look incredibly different than what we think it looks like today. Um, Over here first, I think. <clears throat> Thank you. My name is Dane Hunter. I'm from the University of Illinois, and I also uh, have a family farm. Um, first off, thinking back to your list of different groups that might have stake, and kind of mentioned this, Craig did with uh, the trout, uh, the wildlife groups or hunter groups. I know uh, my dad and I in the last few years have realized that people are willing to pay a substantial amount of money to come deer hunt, and I think some of the habitat that can be offered through agroforestry, whether it's riparian strips or other things, could help you know, boost quail populations or pheasant populations. And I think that that's, you know, those groups would be very interested in getting more habitat out. And it also might even allow farmers to get a, reap a little bit of a benefit from you know, having some corridors for hunting leases or something like that on their land. Um, secondly, then, another point you mentioned, Craig, about the new farmers. You know, I, so we've got plenty of land. I'm interested in planting trees, but we're traditionally corn, soy, wheat, Southern Illinois. It's really difficult for us to just transition, you know, even if I go out and plant some trees, I'm not set up for that. I don't have the time or, you know, the necessarily the know-how. I think that would be an excellent opportunity for new farmers if I was to plant some functional windbreaks or, you know, some functional strips on my land and then, hey, you're a new farmer. I'll let you rent this for, you know, a low cost, come out. I'll help you can help use my equipment, whatnot, and get started. But you know, this is your job to manage some of these potential agroforestry zones. So I think that both of those are two opportunities that have been not really uh, fully addressed yet. Because I would love to. I would love to be able to plant some trees. And if I knew someone who had you know that skill set and, and that gumption, and say you know here you go, yeah, I'll rent this cheap. You can have these field edges. We'll plant some trees and then take care of it. So. Does you want to respond to that at all? Anyone? Can I ask a question? Sure. What do you see, not only you, but target you now, as the low-hanging fruit relative to agroforestry implementation? From a farmer's perspective? Uh, you, you would be from a farmer's perspective, but from other perspectives too, what would be the easiest, least resistant opportunity to increase tree 
tree population on the landscape. An ecological disaster? Definitely, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> is there a low hanging fruit? And is it trees? Well, that's true. <laughs> well, that's good. Just all right back, Roger. Well, I was just going to briefly, to not really answer your question, but I think... That's happened before. <laughs> what, what I think is so challenging is that that low-hanging fruit looks so different in different regions of the country. And so it gets back to what Mike was saying in his presentation about how, um, you know, we say agroforestry does all of these different things. We say agroforestry serves all these different kinds of landowners. And so what is that unifying message that we end up having when we say forest farming is great for keeping you know, forest land and forests in the Northeast and riparian buffers are really important for de dealing with nitrate questions and it looks different in the West and different in all these different places and so it makes it really hard to talk about agroforestry as a whole and to say this is the low hanging fruit overall, um, which I think perversely ends up being all the more reason to align with other um, conservation practices and, 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 and attach ourselves to that broader message rather than saying, oh, let me tell you the difference between alley cropping and windbreaks, you know, but instead say, this is part of getting more conservation practices across the land. And s but then you run into that same question of, if we keep saying it looks different for every farmer, which is, which is true, local conditions matter, how do you get at that, that broader message? So that's why I'm not really answering your question. But. <laughs> You got to wrap up? Okay. You got time for one more? Uh, Rick, you mentioned about uh, Ranjit Tudata from University of Missouri Center for Agroforestry. Rick, you mentioned about uh, Bell Curve, the conservationists and exploiters. Do you know a value the conservationist can remain as conservationist? So if we can develop a method that those people can get money short term and long term, we might be able to keep the conservationists as conservationists. It could be the challenge for us. That's, that's a great question. Policy. Looks like they direct it to you, right? Yeah, so, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, how do you create value? Well, one way you create value is by having standards. You know, and I, I mean standards, I don't necessarily mean regulations, but absent a sort of a policy floor or, or some sort of standard floor, the conservation farmer is always going to be at a disadvantage and there's not, it's going to be extremely hard to create value through policy absent finally taking a deep breath and going down that road within the agriculture community. The, you know, so then having said that, the, um, the other thing I would say, and this is longer term, right? So the only time things get fixed is when they're broken, right? I mean, especially in policy, right? We don't take the policy civic in at regular basis and do its regularly scheduled maintenance, right? We wait until it's broken down by the side of the road. So I think the other way you're going to start to create value is, is some of these conventional production practices are starting to fail. And they're not going to work for landowners very well the way they have worked in the past because of uh, unfriendly, unfriendly or climate or weather regime because of weed resistance, because of insect resistance. And, you know, I already see that happening with like cover crops that are creating value for farmers because they can get into their fields in the spring, even if the rain has been heavy because of the cover crop while their neighbors are not getting into the field or when they get into the field their tractor stays in the field for quite a while until they can get it out of the mud so so i do see these i, I think there are opportunities emerging because of the challenges that farmers are facing and they, they may come to you not because they're necessarily conservation minded but because they're confronting challenges that the that, that the current standard way of farming is not 
meeting. And I think that I think that's increasingly going to be a really big issue on the landscape. And if you know, if you folks have solutions for them, right, they will be very interested. But they may very well, most of them may very well wait to the very last minute until they've tried every other possible thing to maintain their current farming system before they they finally start thinking about making that kind of significant change. When technology fails. First compromise. Is it? Mm-hmm. Thank you. Do, 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 do. Oh. No, not that. Okay. Okay. I would change the subject. Oh. Oh. Um, unfortunately, we will have to cut this short. I do appreciate your courtesy by actually staying here. <clears throat> but I couldn't avoid, I always throw out catfish bait because I try to prompt people into those actions that I don't have the expertise for. And just taking some of the sentences in sequence, there was the discussion about being part of that larger community. Um, that we have dis different decision makers that must be appealed to. We need to make a goal and a plan, and then we need to, I think, be proactive with that. And immediately, I then, that's Mom Apple Pie Chevrolet, but Craig brought me down to something a little bit more specific. He essentially talked about this great opportunity with Trouts Unlimited. You know, essentially an advocacy group that's a dot org. That dot org taking up that opportunity and then promoting that. And the question I have for AFTA, do we as a group need to be looking at this bigger picture question somehow within our organization so at least maybe a small group of people trained in this can start figuring out who that .org might be? And I'll even be um, blatant enough to say environmental working group might indeed be that. You know, we don't know. We don't know enough of the, at least I don't. I'm a soil microbiologist. I am the least policy savvy person in this room. So how does AFTA go and seek this out? So at this point, um, I will not stand between you and your lunch. Even though this is the formal ending of this presentation, let's explore this some more. Uh, before we all leave, uh, let's stand, extend a big round of applause for our panelists up here. <laughs> and really an even bigger one for that fourth speaker. We all, I think, were great. This is the third day. We ate way too much food yesterday. But we had some really good questions coming up that we don't normally ask at this meeting. So again, thank you very, very much.